All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Torah Studies. Parshas Vayechi. This week, we are reading the last portion of the first book in the Torah. We say, Chazak, Chazak, Venit Chazak. We're going to conclude the, ter- the first book, and we say, let us be strong, let us strengthen ourselves. The Torah gives us the strength. The book of, first book, Bereshit, is something that really paves the way for the Jewish people with the, all the stories of the ancestors. And this week we read with the story of Yaakov. Yaakov lives his final 17 years in Egypt. And he's going, is before he's passing, he calls his children, he wants to give them the blessings. The blessings that he gave was to all of the children. And uh, what we are going to discuss tonight is the topic of leadership, getting the job done, marks of a true leader. And uh, why? what does it have to do with us? Is this something uh, to be a leader? Is something that uh, maybe prime ministers and presidents need to study about? But the truth is, we know the Rebbe wants us all to be leaders. The Rebbe says, everyone is a leader in their own right, in their own way, in their own circles. There's the famous story that uh, Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Sachs of uh, England, chief rabbi of Britain, he mentions the story when he was by the Rebbe in 1968. It was uh, the Rebbe, he had a discussion with the Rebbe in, uh, as a student, and then the Rebbe turned the table around, as he said, and he started asking Jonathan questions about uh, Cambridge University, about the Jewish students, what is he doing? And he like didn't want to have anything to do with it, but the Rebbe convinced him to take a role of, of leadership. And the famous uh, statement what uh, Dr. Sachs, Rabbi Sachs said, that a good leader creates a lot of followers. A great leader creates a lot of leaders. And that's what he said was the Rebbe. Now the Rebbe created leaders. The Rebbe once he sees the leadership quality in each and every one. And therefore we need to know what is what makes a leader, what takes to become a leader, to make to be a good leader. And indeed, the Rebbe teaches us um, a very interesting lesson from the story of this week's Torah portion. As we said, Yaakov is gathering all of his children before his passing, and he wants to bless them. But not only blessings, but they're also chastising. Of Rahuven, of Shimon, of Levi. And uh, what we're going to focus today is on Rahuven. That Rahuven, he was the firstborn. And as a firstborn, he deserves to a special place, special things that he needs to have. However, Yaakov is telling him that he lost the opportunity to to be the leader. Why did he lose the opportunity to be the leader? Let's see inside. So, Yaakov begins by saying, Reuven Bechoriata, Reuven, you are my firstborn, my strength, and the first of my, of my might. You should have been superior in rank and superior in power because he's the firstborn. However, Yaakov continues, you have the restlessness. Do you have the restlessness of water 
therefore you shall not have superiority. For you ascended upon your father's couch, then you profaned him who ascended upon my bed. What is this talking about? What is it? What is this talking about? So we know the story of uh, what happened with Reuven. We're going to first read it inside, and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue. We'll explain. So it says, Pachas Kamaim Rashi explains, you have the restlessness of water, the restlessness and haste, which, with which you hasted to display your anger, similar to water that hastened on, this, on its course. Therefore, you shall not have, the, uh, have superiority. You shall no longer receive all the superior positions that were fit for you, now, what was the restlessness that you exhibited? For you ascended upon your father's couch and you profaned that name that ascended my couch. This is the Shechina, which was accustomed to going up on my bed. So, so again, the story, what is the story here? We know that uh, Yaakov had four wives. The main wife was Rachel. He came to marry Rachel. And his father in law Lavan gave him, in a trick away, uh, he tricked Yaakov and gave him Leah instead. So he married Rachel and Leah. And then each one of them, Rachel had a maid and Leah had a maid. And the wives, Rachel and Leah, gave the maids to Yaakov, to have more children with them, to become also, they were the concubines. So, then what happened? Yaakov, Yaakov, um, after Rachel died, tragically, very young, when she gave birth to Binyamin, she died. And Yaakov was constantly, the, his main dwelling place, his, his living quarters was mainly by Rachel. But then after Rachel died, what Yaakov did, he took the bed and he placed it in the tent of Bilha. Bilha was Rachel's maid. Now Reuven, the firstborn, the son of Leah, Rachel's sister, was very mad, very upset. He said, it's enough, it's enough. If, if uh, my mother would have a competition with her sister, that Yaakov would have the bed in, in her sister mainly. Now that my sister, but her sister died, Yaakov, the father, took the bed and put it into the maid's tent. So he took the bed and he placed it in his mother's tent. That's what he did. Now, the way it's written in the Torah may be misleading. In the Torah, it says, Vayishka vay yes, uh, that Reuven laid with the concubine of his, of his father. But that wasn't the case, only because what he did, that he, he got involved and he interfered in his father's private business. And therefore, the Torah considers it as if he laid with his mother's, with his father's concubine. And that's what we see in the Gemara. So that was, was Yaakov chastising Reuven. And he tells him that he lost his privileges because of what he did. Because he hasted and he took and, and he got involved and he interfered in his father's business. And he desecrated the one who is on the father's bed because Hashem was there. It was all Yaakov's dealing and, 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 and 
It's all it always, you know, by the tzaddikim, the righteous people, they're, they're, they're mundane sleeping and eating and drinking and, and, and whatever they did, the relationship with whom they have, when they have, that's all godly things. It was all spiritual things. So Reuben interfered, and that's what Yaakov chastised them. So as we see further inside, So this is from the Talmud that says, it was taught in the Baisa that Rabbi Shimon ben Eloza said, what is the meaning of the verse? And Reuven lay with Bilha, his father concubine. It does not mean that he lay with her literally. Rather, it means that Reuven protested the affront to his mother. And he said, if my mother's sister Rachel was a rival to my mother, will my mother's sister's concubine be a rival to my mother? So he immediately stood and rearranged her bed so that Jacob would enter Leah's tent. And this interfering in his father's personal affairs, that was custom very dearly. He lost the privileges. He lost the privileges of having the koanim coming out of him, and he lost the privileges of having the royalty, the kings. And Yaakov said that instead of the kings coming from Reuven, instead he gave it to Yehuda. So Yehuda was the chosen one. He was the chosen for the monarchy, for the royalty. As Yaakov continues, as it says, we'll read in this week's Parsha, Gur Arye Yehuda, a cub and a grown lion is Yehuda. From the prey, my son, you withdrew. He crouched, rested like a lion, and like a lion who will who will rouse him? In Hebrew, a lion is Arya and Lavi, two names for a lion. And then he says, Lo Yasser Shevet Miyuda, the scepter shall not depart from Yehuda, nor the students of the law from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Who is Shiloh? Shiloh is Mashiach. Until the coming of Mashiach. Yehuda will be the leader. Yehuda will have the scepter. He will be the teacher. And to him will be gatherings, gathering of people. Why Yehuda? What was so special about Yehuda that he deserved to be the king? So Yaakov continues, says, he says, as Rashi explains in these, in these words, Gur Aryer Yehuda, Miteref Beni Alita, from the prey, my son, you withdrew. What does it mean, you withdrew from prey? That means he withdrew from killing someone. What was it? So Rashi says, Beni Alita, my son, you withdrew. You withdrew yourself and said, what is the gain if we slay our brothers, our brother, and cover him and cover up his blood? All of the story, the story of the selling of Yosef. Going back some years, the brothers were, were uh, upset with Yosef, angry with him, jealous of him. Anything and everything, what you can only imagine. And Yosef comes when, uh, when they are out in the field and they decided, that's it, we're going to kill him. But then, instead, they ended up selling him. They ended up selling him. Who was the one that is, told them to sell him? After they put him into the pit, into the... He was in the pit there. Yehuda came and told them, Ma betza, what will we gain if we slay our brother? 
let's sell them, let's sell them to the Ishmaelites. And that's what he did. So that's what Yaakov says to Reuven, to Yehuda. You withdrew from, from, uh, from prey, and that's why he deserves to get the, the kingdom. Another thing, another reason why Yehuda was uh, chosen is also because of the story, the story of Tamar. If you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we read, we, we had a class about it. So what happened? Yehuda had, um, he had, a son, he had three sons, and he married off his son to Tamar. The son was not behaving in the eyes of God, and he died. Then he gave the second son to Tamar, and he also died. And Yehuda let her alone, and she realized that she's not she's not going to have any children. She wanted to have children, and she covered herself up, and she came in the intersection where Yehuda was passing by. She posed, posed as, a, as a prostitute, and Yehuda had a relationship with her, and she became pregnant from Yehuda. And then what happened? Yehuda finds out that his daughter-in-law is pregnant. And based on the laws that applied in those days, we're not going to go into this, then why? She deserved to die. But then she ta they take her out, and she says she didn't want to pinpoint, say to Yehuda, you are, the, <laughs> you are the culprit. She just said Yehuda gave her collateral. She gave her a staff and a ring, and... Uh, a signet ring and a, and a cloak and she said to him to whom this items belong I am pregnant to that person now Yehuda could have just ignored her not to humiliate himself and let her die but he didn't he said she's right She's, the, she's pregnant for me. So that was a, took a lot, of, uh, a lot of guts and a lot of strength from Yehuda that he admitted, and that is also reason why Yaakov said that he deserves to become king because of that. Okay? So this is the, the verses that it says in the Torah. She was taken out and she sent to her father-in-law, saying, from the men to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she says, please recognize, whose signet ring, cloak, and staff are these? Then Yehuda recognized them, and he said, she is right. It is from me, because I did not give her to my son Shayla. But he no longer continued to be intimate with her. So that was the reason. So Yehuda's courage to publicly admit his sin and bear he, the humiliation rather than send someone to death, that earned him and his descendants the privilege of the Jewish monarchy. However, the question is, these two qualities that we said, that because of these two qualities, Yaakov chose Yehuda. But if you read it, the whole, if you think about it, the whole story about saving, saving Yosef. So because Yehuda saved Yosef, that's why he deserved it. But if you if you remember the story, what, what the way it went, who was the one to first save Yosef? The brothers wanted to kill Yosef. Reuven came, Reuven, not Yehuda. Reuven came and he said, Why should we kill him? Don't kill him. 
ואיש מרובן ויצא להם ידם. לא ינקנו נפש, he told, he told Reuven said, we're not, we're not going to kill him. He told him, put him into this pit in the desert and don't, don't touch him. In other words, he was saying to them, let him die alone. We shouldn't actually kill him. What was his intention? He wanted to save him. He wanted to bring him back to his father. So, Reuven was the first one. Now, what did Yehuda do? Yehuda took him out, and what did he do? He didn't really save him to bring him back to his father. He sold him as a slave. So why is Yehuda deserving royalty to become king and not Reuven? Reuven was the first one to want to save him and to bring him back to his father, not to sell him as a slave. And the same thing is with the other quality. We said the second quality of Yehuda is because he admitted to his guilt, took the hum humiliation in order to save someone. But the truth is, we find about Reuven doing the same thing. Reuven also admitted the guilt, what he did with the story with Bila. He admitted that he was the one to play, to interfere in his father's business. And he, in fact, he did Teshuvah for this. Reuven was the first one that we learned that he did Teshuvah. He repented for the act, what he did. So, this is what we see in the next text. So we see the story with, with, with Yosef. What do we see there? So the brother said one to another, behold, that the dreamer is coming. Yosef was coming and they said, here, the dreamer is coming because he was the one that had the dreams that he's going to be king and so on. The dreamer is coming, they said. So now let us kill him and we will cast him into one of the pits and we will say a wild beast dev devoured him. And we will see what will become of his dreams. But Reuven heard and he saved him from their hands. And he said, let us not deal with him. Let us not deal him deadly, a deadly blow. And Reuven said to them, do not shed blood. Cast him into this pit, which is in the desert. But do not lay your hand upon him. And why did he say it? In order to save him from the, from the hands to return him to the Father. So that's the question. Why then is Yaakov choosing Yehuda over Reuven? Here, he wanted to save him. Reuven wanted to save him. And also, as far as the admitting and repenting, we find that Reuven was repenting. As we see in the next, the next uh, text, okay? Yehuda, we said, yes, he admitted that he's, he, he, get the, the humility, he get the humiliation to say that he's guilty. But Reuven, what did he do? He also, he was repenting for years. Because we know when they sold Yosef, Reuven wasn't there. Reuven wasn't there. That's why when he, when he came back, he said, what would I do? The, the boy is not here. Where was Reuven? What did he do? So the Medrash says, where was Reuven when Yosef was sold? Rabbi Eliezer said he was occupied with his sackcloth and ashes which means he was putting sackcloth and ashes and literally, bitterly crying to Hashem and asking forgiveness. He was doing a lot of forgive, uh, praying to be forgiven. When was this? How long after the, the, the sin that he did? It was nine years later. It was nine years later. When Rachel died, Yosef was about uh, nine, eight years old, and when he was sold, he was 17 years old. It was nine, year, nine years later that Reuven is still praying and asking forgiveness. 
And then Reuven returned to the pit, and behold, Yosef was not in the pit. So he rent, he rent his garments. And he returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone and I, where will I go? So that's the question. So we see if you put the Reuven and Yosef together, you put the portraits, you're gonna line up the portraits. What do you see? Reuven wanted to save Yosef to bring back to his father. Yehuda saved Yosef, but he sold him as a slave. Reuven wanted to do teshuva, and, and he did teshuva for years and years. But Yehuda, Yehuda, yes, he admitted, and he took your humiliation, but this was just one, one incident, one event, one thing at one time. We don't find it that he continued with, continued with the repentance. So why then is Yehuda, strong question, why is Yehuda chosen over Reuven? So to understand this, we need to understand a little bit, that's what the Rebbe is explaining. We need to understand, first of all, what is, what is royalty? What is leadership? A king's role is what to lead a nation. To lead a nation, to take care of the needs, to make sure the economy, the welfare, to ensure social and judicial justice. And, in, and therefore a king is really, is situated above the people. He's above the people in a much higher level. In the Kabbalah, it says that the king has something that is called hitnasut. What is hitnasut? Hitnasut means to be elevated, to be aloof, to be above the people. It is the, the, the attribute of royalty that Fried the Karab explains in a mimer. It is the, the, the royalty malchus has is different than other attributes. When you are when you have an attribute of kindness, for example, that attribute has nothing to do with others. You can be kind even if though even if they're not you don't have who to be kind to. You can have the, the attribute of kindness yourself. But the attribute of royalty, royalty is, is to be elevated, to be aloof above someone else. You cannot be in, a, in an empty desert and be royal. You have no one to be royal to to be in, in a higher level. So the royalty has an internal level of, of uh, in a soul that is elevated above a love, above others. But in the same time as we shall soon see, the whole entire royalty is in order to be king above others and to care for others. Let's see in the words of the Friedrich the Rebbe. Uh, there is a saying of Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar, he says, Yesh am belo melech, aval ein melech belo am. There is a people without a king, but there is no king without a people. For a king to be king, you have to have a people. So in the Friedrich Abba's words, he says the sphere of royalty, Malchus, differs from other spheres, other attribute, attributes. He says this can be explained in terms of the qualities of the human soul. In the case of the attributes of kindness, it can exist 
even if there is no beneficiary of, of that generosity. One who is inherently a good person has goodness and kindness in their heart. And if they happen to encounter someone who needs it, they will extend that kindness and goodness. Moreover, this internal quality of kindness can manifest as a feeling even, even if it isn't directed at anyone per se. As seen in the case of Avram Avinu, our patriarch Abraham, who always experienced the feeling of kindness. Therefore, after Abraham's circumcision, when God made it exceptionally hot outside this way to dissuade the passerby from burdening Abraham, it bothered him because the kindness was manifest within, within him. So kindness, you need to have, uh, you, you have the kindness in you, whether you have a, 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 a recipient or not. So that's why when he didn't have the recipient, this, his kindness was in him and he was pained for not being able to express this kindness. However, in the attributes of royalty, which is the sole quality of preeminence, this cannot exist without another person. As we see empirically, Empirically, someone lost in barren desert, devoid of other people, does not experience the attribute of preeminence. You don't feel the preeminence. A king needs to have a people. And this is true to a human king, but this is also actually true when we talk about God. God himself, so to speak, he needs us to be king. When God created the world, first thing what Adam Arishan did, Adam, what he did, he anointed God as king. As it says, he gathered the animals and everyone, and it says, Bone Ishtachav, let us bow down to the king. And in a sense, that's what we that's what we do. We do also. We every Rosh Hashanah. As the Gemara says, that Hashem says, Say before me verses of kingship, so you make me king among you. So the king has on both sides, which is the case also with what we're talking, Lehavdil, to separate between God, obviously, and human king. But the similar quality is required by a king. A king, on the one hand, it needs to be above, it needs to be aloof, it needs to be elevated among the people. But he cannot, but number one, he cannot be king without the people. The people make the king, they have to appoint him as a king. He needs, so number one, he needs people, and they needs to be willingly, they need to appoint them as a king. If you're going to become a dictator and dictate, you're not a king. You need to have the people to be the king, the people's will. So yes, the people are called Am. Am means the people. Am means also Amemut, which means Dim. And they're much, much lower level than the king. But in the same time, the king's entire being and his entire royalty is for the people. All of the, the, greater, the, the great uh, luxury that the king has, the awesomeness of the king, when they, see the, when, they, when they see the royalty and the majestic palace, what is this all about? It is for the people to rever revere the king as the royal leader. But all of this is for the king to be able to lead the people and to be de dedicated to the people. As we see in the next text, 
the Medrash, it says, the nation appoint, appoints the king, and the king cannot appoint himself if they do not appoint him. That's number one. And then the Rambam says, the Ramadis explains the great responsibility, the awesome responsibility that the king has. It says, just as the Torah granted the king great honor, and obligated everyone to revere him, so too, as it commanded, as it commanded him to be lowly and em empty at heart, as it is written regarding the King David, my heart is a void within me, nor should he treat Israel with overbearing haughtiness, as it is written, he should not lift up his heart above his brothers. He has to be very humble to the people. He should be gracious and merciful to the small and the great, involving himself in the good and welfare. He should protect the honor of even the humblest of men. When he speaks to the people as a community, you should speak gently, as it is written, listen, my brothers and my people. Similarly, it is written, if today you will be a servant to these people, he should always conduct himself with great humility. So that's the bottom line here. What is a king? A king on the one end is elevated, is aloof, is way above the people, but it's all for the people. And this is why someone who is too caught up with himself, he cannot be king. So yes, you can have people who are reaching very high levels in themselves. People who seek to to improve themselves spiritually, to grow spiritually. But if it's all about yourself, then you may be a great person, but you cannot be a leader. A leader needs to have the proper understanding. The number one, not to haste into hasty conclusions and decisions. And when you see something, to be able to to judge properly, to look at the whole picture, to see if your actions will offend someone else, will hurt someone else. So again, if you're about yourself, then it's fine. You're growing yourself in a spiritual way. But to be a leader, you can't just jump to conclusions right away and, and, and do things which will benefit yourself the way you see it right now you have to see how this will affect the entire people. And this is what Yaakov is saying when he came to Reuven. When he came to Reuven, his immediate reaction, when he took the bed of Yaakov and took it out from Bilhah's tent to, to Leia's tent, his mother's tent, yes, he did it, for, thing, for reasons that he thought was justified, to protect his mother's honor. But he didn't take in, in, in consideration what, who may get hurt in the process. Ultimately, his mother himself also got more, even more humiliated. And obviously, Yaakov was humiliated. So that's, Yaakov says, you may think you're doing the right thing and in your way yes you're trying to do the right thing but you were hasty in these decisions so this Yaakov told Uven that what cost him the monarchy was how he hastened to display his anger at his father for what he perceived to be an affront to his mother's honor Reuven crossed the line he should not have crossed and mixed into his father's personal affairs. As the Rebbe says, 
Reuven had the restlessness of water, as the verse says, pachas kamayim. And he hastened to display his anger after concluding that his father's bed belonged in Leah's tent, his mother's tent. He got upset at someone else and acted swiftly and immediately to interfere with his father's bed, thus hurting another person. This behavior is opposite of helping others. And that is not leadership. Leadership is about helping others. And let's go back to the other story. The other story was, we said, why was Yehuda chosen? Because he saved Yosef. And we asked the question, wait a second, Yehuda saved Yosef. Reuven was the first one to save Yosef. But if you think about it, what is the difference? The difference is, Reuven wanted to save Yosef. Did he end up saving him? No. What did he end up doing? He ended up do, putting him in a pit. The pit, as our sages say, was filled with scorpions and snakes. That itself was a big danger for Yosef. And what did Reuven do at the time? He was busy with what? With doing teshuva, with repentance. So he went and, 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 and then put up his sack and cloth and he wasn't there when Yosef was sell because he was busy with himself, his self-spiritual improvement, which is noble. It's great doing teshuva. You learn from Reuven to do teshuva. But guess what? That's not a leader. When your brother is in a pit and he's in danger, it's not a time to sit and pray. You have to do something about it. What did Yehuda do? Yehuda, yes, maybe he's, he's, uh, he wasn't completely noble in the, in the act, what he did. He said, let us make some money out of our brother. But the bottom line is that he took him out and he saved his life. He says, my betza, but the, my betza, what's the point? What gain do we have if we kill our brother? He took him out and he saved him. That is the difference. That is the difference between Reuven and Yehuda. As the Rebbe explains, the difference between Yehuda's withdrawing from prey and Reuven is this. When Yehuda withdrew from, from prey, he actually saved another person. When Yehuda said, what is the gain? He saved Yosef from the brother's plan to kill him. And he took him out of the pit which contains snakes and scorpions. Although Reuven's intention were nobler than Yehuda, that has to do with his own personal qualities and has nothing to do with his ability to benefit and save others. When he said, let us not deal with him a deadly blow, cast him into the pit, this pit in order to save him from the, their hands, to Reuven, uh, to return him to the father, it tells us about his intentions. But practically, that didn't extricate Joseph from the danger of, uh, of starving to death, neither from starving to death or being uh, killed by the scorpions or the snakes. Not only that, if you read carefully into the words, Reuven really had more, he was concerned about himself also. Yes, he wanted to save Yosef, but he also was concerned about himself. Why? Because he said, what will happen? He saved them, they say, the Torah said, the man at in order to save him. To save whom? To save Yosef. But our Rashi says not only to save Yosef, he wanted to save his own, his own uh, honor, his own himself, basically. Why? 
Because Reuben said, I am the firstborn, I'm the oldest of the brothers. We all come back to our father Yaakov, who will be blamed? I will be blamed. So he wanted to save Yosef, yes, to save him, but also to, to take away the blame from him. So he had his own personal agenda there. That's what Rashi says. To save him, the Ruach HaKodesh, the divine spirit says, testifies, meaning Hashem testifies to, for Reuven that he said this only to save him so that he would be able to come and take him out of there. He said, I am the firstborn and the eldest of them all. The sin will be attributed only to me. And the same thing is in the next text. It says, Vayashev Reuven el when Reuven returned to the pit, and behold, Yosef was not there was not in the pit, so he rent his garment, and he returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone, and I, I, where will I go? What does it mean, where will I go? So Rashi says, where will I go? Where will I flee from the father's pain? Again, so it's about me. It's about Reuven. This is... This is the difference. And when it comes to the admitting also, when it comes to admitting the sin, our sages tell us that Reuven admitted the sin, you know when? It took him many years later. Why did it mean, did the Reuven admit for what he did with his father's bed? Because only after when he saw what Yehuda did, Yehuda showed that he admitted the guilt. That gave Reuven the courage to say, you know what? I was also guilty. As it says in the Talmud, Yehuda admitted that he sinned with Tamar and was not embarrassed to do so. And what was his hand? He inherited the life of the world to come. Reuven admitted that he sinned with his father's bed and was not embarrassed. And what was his end? He too inherited the life in the world to come. Who served as the impetus to, for Reuven to admit the sin, that was Yehuda. So the Gemara says, Rabbi Haskuni says, Reuven at first admitted his sins privately with sackcloth and fasting, but he did not confess publicly. However, when Yehuda said, she is right, it is from me, Reuven got up, and publicly confessed, I too have sinned, I interfered with my father's bedding. And the Gemara is asking a question. The Gemara says, granted, with regard to Yehuda, it was proper that he admitted his sin in public, so that Tamar would not be burned. But why did Reuven admit his sin in public? What was the point? Didn't Rav Sheshet say, I consider one who specifies his sin in public to be brazen as one who does not indicate that he is not embarrassed by his actions? In other words, to just to come and say in, in public, you know what I did, I sinned, I did this, I did that. That's a chutzpah. Why would you admit like you're not embarrassed with the sins? So why, what was the reason? Why did Reuven admit in public the sin that he did? I can understand why Yehuda admitted because he needed to, to save Tamar and the children, the, the unborn children. Why did Yehuda do this? Why, I'm sorry, why did Reuven admit? And the, and the Talmud says, the reason was so that his brothers should not be suspected of having committed the deed. He admitted in order for his brothers not to be suspected. Okay, so what does that what does that tell you? 
What does that tell you? It tells you that many years Reuven went along and his brothers were the suspects. Yaakov didn't know who did this for many years until Reuven actually admitted it. So the brothers were suspects. So again, you see in Reuven that he was not in the level of Yehuda. And if you think about it, what was the result? What was the result of Reuven saving? Reuven saved uh, Yosef and he put him into the pit. What was the result of that? Yosef was sold as a slave and we got the exile. What was the result of Yehuda admitting and, and Tamar not to be burned? Peretz was born. Peretz was, the, Peretz was the ancestor of Mashiach. Mashiach comes from Peretz. So this is the difference. That's what the Rebbe says. This is what it means, true quality of a leader. Quality of a leader is about caring for the other, even if it's on the expense of your own spiritual improvement. Yes, of course, we need to work on ourselves. It says, you have to beautify yourself before you beautify others. But when you see someone in danger, you have to go and act. And this is why we are called Yehudim. We are called Jews. Jews comes from Judah. Because that quality, says the Rebbe, the quality of Yehuda really is the quality of each and every Jew. The quality of being able to, on the one hand, be aloof, be connected with Hashem, and be above the problems, and at the same time, be concerned and caring with each and every human being, each and every Jew, and Lahavdil Nanjus, to care for them, to make sure they have what they need, to make sure that they have their spirit, physical need and the spiritual needs. Being a leader, as the Rebbe said, is a job of everyone, and that is the only way that we will bring Mashiach together. Let us hope it happens very soon. Amen. Amen, Rabbi.